Hello, everybody, and welcome. We're live now, Lars? Yes, we are. Fantastic. Very excited to be here uh, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, wherever you are. Obviously, the Foundation for the Study of Cycles is a global uh, research organization. We've got members all over the world, and we could not be happier than to be here uh, with everybody today. I already have more than 200 people uh, joined, uh, about 600 people registered, and, and we really didn't advertise this much at all. Um, so this is really uh, a seminal event for the foundation. Um, I'm Dr. Richard Smith. I'm the chairman and CEO of the foundation and with me uh, today, tonight, actually tonight for you guys, uh, Andy Pancholi in London. Thanks for joining us, Andy. Good evening, everybody, or good afternoon. <laughs> and Lars von Thienen in Germany. Where are you in Germany, Lars? Yeah, Hamburg. Good, good ev evening, everyone. <laughs> all right. So, so it's and what time is it there? <laughs> ten o'clock. Yeah, it's ten o'clock. Late in are, the evening. Are the kids in bed? Yeah, on on its way. So. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, we've got a lot of information to share with everybody tonight, and um, but I just wanted to start out with a little update on what's happening with the foundation. Uh, one of the biggest um, pieces of information is that. Uh, we are officially once again a 501c3 uh, not-for-profit educational corporation. So it took a lot of work to clean up um, the corporate and legal and uh, tax details, but that's all taken care of now. So we're once again a not-for-profit 501c3 organization. So any of your donations uh, are tax deductible in the United States. But it's really about more than that. It's really about honoring what it means to be a not-for-profit. You know, we really are here, um, a new board of directors to restore the foundation for the study of cycles to what it was originally intended to be, an education and research um, collection of people that are interested in cycles and want to discover cycles and share a knowledge of cycles and help restore a knowledge of cycles to the world. Um, so I think that the timeliness of the foundation uh, coming back to life at this point, it's more important than ever. Um, Andy may share with us tonight, you know, the foundation was started uh, 80 years ago and um, 90 years ago is when the 1929 stock market crash happened. And anybody who's learned about Edward Dewey knows that, um, you know, he started looking into cycles to try to understand what had caused the stock market crash and the depression and to help make sure that something like that never happened again. Um, so here we are today, 90 years later, and I know you're going to be bring some information with us tonight on that, Andy. Um, and a time when astonishingly questions like, are we entering another great depression are on the table. Um, so the foundation has never been more important to help restore some, some balance and through a, an understanding and a knowledge of cycles and um, slow down a little bit. <laughs> so so uh, I'm not gonna take up too much time this evening. I wanna get to the meat of our presentation. I just wanna again say welcome to everybody. Um, if you're not, if you haven't seen the website, it's at cycles.foundation and you can join the foundation. If you're not already a member, you can make a donation to the foundation. Again, we are a 501c3. Um, and we're going to be communicating a lot more. We're gonna have regular webinars. Uh, let me just mention also fellow board members, um, Jake Bernstein, thank you, Jake. I know you're listening in and look forward to doing a webinar with you soon. Uh, Ian Mackay in London, thank you, Ian. Ian's been helping put together some uh, data sets. And also uh, Bill Sarubi, um, who has joined our board of directors recently. So we are all committed to making the uh, foundation accessible and useful to everybody. I think what you're gonna see tonight, um, you'll be pleased about the progress that we've made. So without further ado, Andy, uh, if you could share with us uh, your uh, observations, which everyone, um, Andy Pancholi here, 
the founder of the Market Timing Report. And um, Andy, you've just been doing some incredible work. Uh, I've been following your work for the past couple of years. Uh, you, you truly called this top. Um, you know, I hear a lot of people saying they called tops, but they, they did a lot of calling, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, but you've been adamant about something like this being in the cards and kudos to you. So can you please share with our audience tonight, how you go about studying cycles, especially long-term cycles, how you saw what you saw and what you see, you know, coming down the road. Thank you, Richard. Uh, well, um, it's a big honor and privilege to be here. So thank you. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. So what I'm going to do now is take you through a whistle stop tour of uh, some long term cycles. And let's take a look at um, we're not just going to look at market cycles. We're going to run through a few bits and pieces. So let's uh, uh, really, in my opinion, uh, and I've been telling my followers for the last four or five years that we're now heading and we are there in the most critical financial time period of our generation, if not this century. And it's not just a uh, financial to critical time period, as we all know now. It's very much uh, a, uh, a key point. Uh, just a quick disclaimer with all these things, it is an educational webinar, so uh, there's no uh, tips or anything like that given there. And now let's get stuck in. So by the end of this segment of uh, the session, you will know how to forecast big market crises. Um, and you will also understand why 2020 is unfolding as it is. And uh, in order to, mark, uh, to master market and business cycles, you really have to understand history, because in my opinion, and that's why I've, uh, I'm with the foundation, I've, I've been with them for a long time uh, in various forms, but there is mathematical order behind all these things. Markets and history repeat, behavioral cycles repeat. So I'm going to take you through a very quick overview of uh, what I believe is taking place. Right. As I said already, 2020, we are in a crisis right now. And this is because human behavior moves in cycles. Events recur in patterns and these can be forecast. So let's take a look. Now, I want to start off um, hopefully right under my head. I, we forgot about having our pictures up here is the COVID-19 cycle there. So uh, that's where we are. 2019, 2020. Uh, virus, well, not so much viruses, but pandemic cycles move in 100 year cycles. And if we go back 100 years, as I'm pretty sure you're all aware, because it's been in the news, um, we had the influenza epidemic post First World War. And this was in 1918. And it ran for pretty much um, uh, two years. And uh, my research has shown and uh, uh, that presented to my followers um, two, three years ago, because we were predicting the, the flu crisis back in uh, 2018, which did in fact occur. But back in 1918, 75 to 100 million people died in that epidemic. But you have to go back another 100 years. And when we go back 100 years, we find that we had this cholera pandemic. And uh, this was rife in India, Asia, the Middle East and Europe. Um, there's some argument about whether this was known as the first cholera pandemic or not, but it was huge. So you can see, you know, a hundred year cycle, give or take a year, but you can see how clear this is. And then go back another hundred years and we get to 1717. And there was a huge measles pandemic that was in the colonies by the Great Lakes as colonies, of course, you know, America as it was then. And uh, what we got here was. The whole area from the Great Lakes all the way through to the East Coast, uh, to New England, was gripped with measles and a lot of people died there. In fact, they reckon it was several hundred thousand from my research. So that was the measles pandemic. And then we go back again to 1618 and we had a smallpox pandemic. Again, this was in North America and it spanned from the uh, Penobscot River in Maine all the way down towards Rhode Island. And uh, hey Andy, I'm just going to jump in for one second. I, d I think you should turn off your video so we can see the whole screen. Oh, okay. And then when we yeah. do get back and want to chat, you know, we can we can turn on the video again. But I think it'll be clearer with the slides. OK, yeah, that's absolutely fine. And uh, we're locked down here, so I haven't been able to get a haircut. So I've been really <laughs> that anyway. OK, so time. look at that. You can see you can see everything there. Right. Uh, OK, so where do we get to a smallpox epidemic um, in 1618? Uh, and that lasted a few years. And actually, that wiped out the American Indian population. 90% of the population were wiped out, including the father of Poca uh, Pocahontas, uh, who was known as Chief Powhatan. 
So you can see here, we've got a 400 year cycle, a 300 year cycle, a 200 year cycle, and a 100 year cycle that all came together. So we were expecting something big. But um, let's take this a stage further and bring this in closer into where we are now. COVID-19 really hit the press around about December 2019, um, just a few months ago. But there is roughly an 18 year, 18 and a half year cycle that averages out. And that's why cycles forecasting is a little bit different. You do have to sort of average it out, but it's there. Go back 18 years, November 2002, SARS, um, that was taking place um, especially around the Far East. I went through Singapore Airport on my way down to Australia. I was, uh, it, it was deserted. The airport was deserted, just like now. Go back another 18 years, approximately 18 and a half years, and AIDS and HIV was proliferating. And then we go back again, another roughly 18 years, and we got Hong Kong flu there. So you can see that we've got, not only have we got these 100-year cycles coming together, we also have this 18-year cycle coming together, 18-year cycle set. Now, Richard has already mentioned this, and really this is the basis of our foundation. Um, we are 90 years on from the 1929 crash, and 90 years before that would have taken us back to 1839. Well, 1837 saw the beginning of a collapse, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail in a minute about this. Uh, so 90 years on from then gave us 1929 crash. And now we're here at 2019, 2020. So this is this big crash that we've got. So it's not just a single cycle. It's a double cycle. More on that shortly, folks. But we can take the harmonics. We can take the halfway point and we can go. For, let's start back in 1839, add 1884. There was a huge depression there, um, a crisis. Again, we'll talk to you about that in a minute. Then we get 1929, add another 45 years, which is half of 90, and we get to 1974. Now, some of you will remember 1974. I do. I know despite my youthful looks, you might think that's incredible, but I remember it well. We had an OPEC oil crisis. Does that sound familiar right now? And th th this time, the price of oil went shooting up, and that caused a huge not just recession, but depression in the Western world. So that's exactly what took place. So you can see how these cycles are repeating with absolute precision. Now, uh, here's a, a quick chart. This is a logarithmic chart, and I just I just took it as far as 2019. That was the 29 crash, and on a logarithmic basis, the, this 1974 point was there. And so we're basically reflecting this pattern around there as well. So I just wanted to show you that chart very quickly. Now, we've talked about viruses. We've talked about stock market crashes. We're now going to talk about China and just see how this comes into the fold. So basically, what we're seeing, 2019, go back 30 years, we had Tiananmen Square. For those of you who will remember the iconic picture of the student standing in front of the tank, there were student protests. You know, China, we don't really know what's going on there because it's always been so tightly controlled. But rumor has it that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people were killed at that point. Go back another 30 years, go back 60 years, and we get um, the 1959 Tibetan uprising. The Tibetans were fed up of the Chinese. They, they had a rebellion against them. And double that cycle up again, and we get to the Boxer Rebellion, 1898 to 1900. Again, trouble for China. So you can see now we're going from... This big cycle here, this cycle here, they're all coming together. And that's why China was having a little bit of a problem at, or is having a bit of a problem at the moment. But the story doesn't stop there because there's another cycle which we don't have time to look at. And I call it the revolutionary cycle. Um, it, it's roughly 82 to 84 years. And that takes us all the way back to Mao Zedong and the, what was known as the Long March, a series of marches which really brought communist China to its head. That cycle came in. So what's happened is we've got multiple cycle sets coming together. It's when all the cycles come together that we get something big happening. So what happened in 2019? What's going on in 2020? First of all, China had issues with Hong Kong, huge protest issues with Hong Kong. Secondly, there's a trade war going on between America and China. Next, COVID-19 starts in China. So this is why China, the viruses, and the stock markets are coming together all together. And, that, and so I hope you're finding this information useful. But this is what I look at. So the stock market, China and the viruses all come together in 2020. So 
with regards to the stock market and economy, we're looking at these um, long cycles. We're looking at super long term cycles. Most people don't. We do. And that's what we want to do at the foundation. That's what I do in my work as well. So I don't know. It, this might be a longer process to get a full recovery. It may get worse before it gets better. I don't know. You know, we are seeing some recovery at the moment. It remains to be seen whether it's sustainable. But uh, that's another story. So I just want to bring this in. We, we talked about this 18.6 year cycle. Now, let's just go back to March. If I uh, and I think London, uh, Britain here, sorry, I'm just outside London is representative of most of the places in the world. What did we see? We saw this huge fear as lockdown came in. People were panic buying food. I think that happened in every nation. And uh, there was just this huge element of fear about mass panic almost. Go back 18.6 years. What happened? Go back 18.6 years to March, exactly 18 and a half years. Uh, that took us exactly to September 2001. We were in fear of people flying airliners into buildings everywhere around the world. It was almost an irrational fear. And what's happened to airlines? Airline stocks collapsed in 2001. What have they done right now? So you can see this is a very precise mathematical pattern. And I just wanted to throw that in. But the good news with cycles is that we that after a down cycle, there is an up cycle. We will recover. People came out of the um, 29 to 32 um, depression. We came out of 9-11. Cycles are in seasons and after winter follows spring. So things always get better. So if you can spread the message, if we can spread the message that especially for those who are in a probably less fortunate place than us, and there are plenty that are, Tell them to see the light at the end of the tunnel. There is light at the end of the tunnel and things will get better. And that, that's one of the messages that uh, Dr. Richard Smith and the board and myself want to get out there. Cycles are there. And if we understand them, we can you know, move forward with them and help people understand that things will see an ending and an upturn. Now, uh, so that's an overview of where we're at right now. I'm now going to go into um, some deeper work. Uh, that I think you'll find interesting because by the end of this section, you, you will actually be able to see how ordered markets are and you'll be able to pre uh, pre uh, predict for yourself the next big moves. And uh, how do we do this? Well, over here in my office in London, I've been working on these crisis matrices where I put in everything together and I look for patterns and I do that with my team over here. So I just wanted to share this picture with you and, and I go back as far as I can in history. But uh, let's start off just in case some of you are here as skeptics, just in case, and I'm sure you're not. But let's start off with the decennial cycle. And many of you will be familiar with this, and it just relates to the years of the decade. In fact, we pop this on our website. Um, but this originally started in a book called Tides and the Affairs of Men that was published in 1939 by a gentleman called Edgar Lawrence Smith. Now, he only actually had about 45 years worth of data, but he already found these patterns. And he found that years ending in seven, oh, sorry, three, seven and zero, 10. Yeah. And sometimes six were often down years. But years ending in five, eight and uh, most of the nine years are advancing years. And I'm going to show you a, a graph on this. So don't worry if, if this is just a little heavy. Uh, but he thought that weather, sunspots, radiation, all these things played a part on optimism and pessimism and had a great effect on humans. And that, in turn, was replicated in the markets. So here's a graphical representation. Years ending in zero tend to be the biggest down years. What year are we in now? 2020, it ends in a zero. It's a down year. And years ending in one are slightly down. So that's probably where we're at, just using the decennial cycle. But remember how you saw different cycles coming in from different time periods, they can exacerbate the, the level of the cycle. And that's why we've got a 90 year cycle coming in together as well. But look, take a look at this, you know, years in three, pretty bullish. Years ending in five are very, very bullish. Uh, as are years eight and nine. But what did we see the last two years, eight and nine? The biggest bull market in the history of bull markets, the history of markets. It was very, very exciting. And that's exactly what happened here. And years ending in seven typically are down years. But having said that, 2017 wasn't. Um, but every year um, in the um, 20th century ending in seven uh, was uh, a down year. So that's just a quick overview. Let's move on. The real secret is in super long term cycles. 
it's about knowing where to look so follow me through on this and uh, stay with it and keep an open uh, mind uh, be skeptical by all means i'm not trying to convince you but i will put 10 pounds on it that we will be convinced by the end of this let's start off with a 72 year cycle why the 72 year cycle well you we, we nobody's going to dispute the fact that there was a crash in 1929 we, we've all read about it and just a, a really interesting inconsequential point my father was born the very week my late father was born the very week of the 1929 high so there might be something in that as to how i got into this but take 1929 add 72 years and we get to 2001 what happened in 2000 we got the end of the tech boom it was just a, a slightly you know, a year early effectively uh, so the topping pattern took place into 2001 but what is less well known is if we take 1929 and we head back to 1857 there was a huge panic and again we'll look at that in a minute and that that was a uh, the probably the biggest modern day uh, crash up till that time and it was dual centric and that it, it was effective both in britain and in america here is the 1929 chart again a logarithmic chart that was the high up there 3rd of september 1929 and the market came off 90 percent there and that was back in the low there in July 1932. So just to show you that. So 1857. Now, what this was all about, the end of uh, railroad expansion. Uh, there was various things going on. And uh, what happened here was the market came down 62 percent. And uh, uh, basically a railroad bond funding company in C Cincinnati, the Ohio Life Trust, failed. And that's what precipitated this collapse. Meanwhile, in Britain, there was some shenanigans with uh, what the government were doing with gold. So this caused this panic and this actually lasted uh, all the way through into uh, 1859. So you're seeing these things typically down for a couple of years. 2000, 2001. So this was the uh, let's buy a mobile phone. Let's get on the Internet. Let's buy a PC and uh, uh, let's um, look at semiconductors, high tech stocks. And uh, this took this massive uh, build up there and the market then came down 40 percent. So that was the end of that. So you can see this 72 year cycle is working pretty well. Um, so, right, let, uh, to wake you all up, um, when is the next crash in this cycle? Uh, if you figured it out, take 2001, add 72 years, it takes us to 2073. So tell your grandkids or tell your kids, because that's worth knowing, especially if your kids are young like mine. So 2073, uh, that's a year when there is almost certainly going to be a crash. Now, double that up, 144-year cycle. Why the 144-year cycle? Quite simply because of this. Let's take 1720. You'll have all heard of the South Sea bubble. Uh, you'll have also heard of the Mississippi land crisis. If you add 144 years to that, we get to the Civil War in America. Now, on the 23rd of August, 1864, cotton traded at $1.89. Only a few weeks earlier, it was trading at three cents a pound. So we got a greater than 60 fold increase in price. This was hyperinflationary. Why did this occur? Uh, well, basically, this was a huge bubble caused by the fact that, first of all, there was there was a nobody tilling the fields, farming cotton because they'd all gone out to fight the war. And secondly, there was a war and everybody needed cotton for uniforms. So supply went right down demand went right up the price went through the roof and sorry i didn't really talk about the south sea bubble um that was an inflationary boom uh, on british stock in the south sea but the mississippi land crisis uh, was a a really big event and uh, uh, that was because a guy called john law went and intervened in france and sold them swamp land uh in the mississippi delta saying it was some dreamland and also at the same time, he managed to, to convince France that they should take their money off the gold standard or have it unbacked at least. And so they created fiat currency and created this massive bubble and everybody piled in. So that's that 144 years from South Sea bubble, uh, 1720 uh, took us to 1864. And then you add another 144 years and it takes us to the 2008 commodity boom. The dollar weakened substantially. So therefore, prices uh, went up anyway. There was also a rise in demand as well. So that's just a quick overview on that. And just um, keep an eye on 1720 because that's going to reappear. That's 300 years from now. So um, doubling this up, take set, uh, well, taking 2008, adding 72 years, 2080, then 2152. There's going to be some 
uh, booms and busts there. Long range forecasting is easy. This time you probably need to tell your children to tell their children to tell their children to mark those in diaries. Um, OK, so let's take this a stage further. You can see how easy this long range forecasting is. We're going to look at the 90 year cycle. We've already spoken about it. It's very prevalent in commodity markets as well. Um, and we've already spoken about the 29 crash and we went all the way back to 19, 1839. And there's a quick reminder. We came down 90 percent there. And in 1837. Now, this is a really interesting one. We came down 74 percent. You know, at the time, who would have thought a market would correct 74 percent? But 90 years later, uh, in, in 1929, the market corrected 90 percent. Now, this was all about cheap money in America. And this money was used to open up the canals around the Great Lakes to take the farm produce, the wheat and the corn out there. Um, not no real soybeans at that time. So money was cheap. Uh, land was cheap. There was a massive land bubble. So and it all came to a head here. Uh, in 1837. So you can see how precisely this 90 year cycle is working. Now, we also mentioned this briefly, but 1884. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, the 1884 there saw the, um, um, the, the a bubble here. And this was a, another banking crisis that doesn't look very big, but it was substantial. I can assure you it was over 30 percent because it's a logarithmic chart there. But uh, that was a big crisis as well there. So uh, we talked about 1974 and the oil crisis. So these are the midpoints. Next up, I want to show you the 100 year cycle. And this one is particularly interesting. Well, let's have a look. Um, I was with uh, with a bunch of people back in 2008 um, and somebody said nobody could have seen this coming. And uh, I said I beg to differ because 2007 was 100 years on from the rich man's panic. So there was a huge panic in 1907. And guess what it was based on? It was based on a sudden shortage of credit. What happened in 2007? For those of you that remember, credit dried up. Credit, you know, cheap credit went very, very quickly. We got this huge panic. And here's another interesting thing, by the way. Back in 2000, uh, 1907, JP Morgan himself was called in to uh, help but resolve the crisis. He was called in by the Fed, uh, not the Fed that didn't exist then, but the government. And 100 years later, JP Morgan were one of the key names involved in the global financial crisis. And uh, we can go back um, 50 years, half of this as well. And if we go back from 1907, 50 years, you get 1857. Did you see 1857 anywhere else that appeared in the 72 year cycle? So can you see how this confluence of cycles is very, very important? And 1857 saw runs on banks. 1907 saw runs on banks. 2007 saw a run, uh, a runs on several banks collapsing. We actually had a run on the bank in Britain, a bank called the Northern Rock. So that's that. And also um, 18, uh, sorry, 1957 had a significant uh, uh, downturn as well. Uh, so here's 2007, the global financial crisis. And here the market came down 54 uh, percent in 2007. Uh, so just over halfway, a very significant sell off and quite an orderly sell off. And over there, September the 15th, off the top of my head, 2008, that was Lehman Brothers there. And that precipitated the, the big collapse. So that was 2007. 1907 rich man's panic, as I say, caused by the withdrawal of credit. Look at that, a huge collapse. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm, I'm sure it's 60 or 70. I think it was closer to 70 percent, that one. So that's very precise. Uh, but the story doesn't stop there. Go back another 100 years to 1807. The Napoleonic Wars were uh, going on and America was trying to sort of stay in and out of it. And uh, well, I was really trying to stay out of it. And they, they uh, Congress passed an act called the Embargo Act and it banned trade. But it's in the simple terms, it banned trade with the rest of the world because they thought that would stop people fighting uh, and, and it created blockades in Europe. But that one backfired big time. It was America that suffered and the market came off over 70 to 75 percent. So now you're seeing this 1807 plus 100 years, 1907, rich man's panic plus 100 years. 2007 global financial crisis. And also, if you wanted to go back to 1707, you'll see some interesting things in history there as well. So this is the 100 year cycle, taking the midpoints of these 1957, not a panic. So this is uh, just to clarify this. Um, we got 1907. We add 50 years takes us to 1957. We got a recession in the United States from 57 to 58. Why did 
that recession take place basically because everybody that could afford a refrigerator now had one. Everybody that wanted a television and could afford one now had one. And by the way, the 1929 crash, the, the boom was fueled partly by the rise of radio. Um, so basically all mod cons for the late 50s, automobiles, refrigerators, uh, televisions, everybody had got one. And uh, there were some unionization issues as well. And we got this orderly sell off. So there was a recession there uh, in the uh, halfway cycle. And the, the market there came down 20 percent. So not a huge crash, but certainly a substantial sell off. That was 1957. 1857, we've already talked about this. Um, the biggest banking failure to date up till that date. Uh, and it was because of the end of the railroad boom. And it was the Ohio Life uh, Insurance and Trust failed in Cincinnati. And this precipitated a global panic. And you can see this was absolutely huge. You know, the market came down from uh, just shy of 22 all the way down to eight. So a very big panic. And that was, uh, um, as I say, dual centric because there were gold issues in Britain as well. 50 year cycle. Right. So I just wanted to show you this another example of this 50 year cycle. Some of you will remember the 87 crash. I certainly do. Uh, if you go back to 1937, look at the pattern overlay. The the high, we got this run up. The high was to the day. The low was to the day. And the pattern was fairly similar after it. So this is the sort of order that I see in markets. It isn't perfect, but I just wanted to share that with you. So let's just bring this uh, to a conclusion now. And I just want to show you why 2019 into 2020 has been such an important time period. Basically, 2019, 90 years from the 1929 crash. So, and, and we just spilled into 2020. 2019, 45 years, the half cycle from the 1974 low. 2019, 100 years from the 1919 oil panic. I haven't mentioned that, but that's what we've got. So, you know, by the time you add a few weeks or months, we've spilt into 2020 and that's the way it works. 2020 is really, you know, that was that was where the acceleration, the continued acceleration from the 29 crash. It's also 300 years from the uh, South Sea bubble, 300 years from the Mississippi land crisis. These are all financial crises. And 2020 is also 200 years from the 1819-1820 land panic. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Richard Smith and myself uh, uh, and another friend of ours uh, over there in San Francisco, we do have some mastermind groups and, and our friend over there, um, he, he is absolutely adamant that commercial real estate has really had its day. And, and we can see that now. And this is as a direct result, really, of this 200 year cycle from the land panic from uh, 1820. And there was also a land panic in 1920. So, you know, this is commercial real estate cycles coming in, real estate and land. But also coming up soon, and in fact, the anniversary is this month, 72 years, which is a bunch of 18 year cycles from uh, the creation of Israel is this, yes, this month. There were a lot of issues creating conflict. So watch out, we're gonna see an escalation in conflict, partly due to the price of oil. Um, so th that is coming up outside the scope of this presentation, folks. And finally, 2020 is 144 years, which is two 72 year cycles from the British Suez Canal uh, issues as well. There were some financial issues there. So all this is focusing around the Middle East. So folks, that's it. Um, uh, I will, um, let me see, here we go. That's a quick tour of everything I have to say. Here I am back in the corner. So uh, Richard, are you there? I am here. So Andy, that was a ton of information. <laughs> Can you bring that chart back up? Somebody asked if we could go back to slide number 23. Number 23? Actually. Yeah. 23, hey, let's see what's on slide number 23. Twenty-three slide. Um, You're not sharing your slides. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't want to put you through. Um, go ahead. slide number twenty-three. Did they? Um, what specifically were they asking about? Ah, uh, let's see. Somebody asked specifically for Who's slide that? twenty-three. I'm not sure what was on it. But let's go back to that, that last slide you were showing. The very last one? The very last yeah. one, yeah. Let so, me just turn that off and fast forward it. Nearly there, folks. 
And just my question to you, you know, I mean, these are really long term cycles. It's hard, you know, to, I mean, something like a 90 year cycle, right? Can't that be plus or minus a few years? Yeah. I mean, I typically you'd want to add one percent or up, well up to five percent really i think of the time mm-hmm. so if you're looking at say if we moved into daily cycles if you're looking at a hundred day cycle you, you might want to add uh sorry 100 days you might want to add five days either side you know for a degree of accuracy mm-hmm. and that's the thing is that the thing richard with this is that these cycles can blur a little bit so you yeah. kind of need to have fuzzy lenses to see them. And, uh, yeah, and so what I'm interested in, you know, how did, how did you really use this in your own work? Because you've been anticipating this for a while, right? I mean, you wrote about it a few years ago in your book, Zero Hour. Um, you must have been a little bit on edge, <laughs> you know, studying history the way you do and seeing kind of anticipating all these cycles coming together. Uh, you know, how did you manage that yourself? So what we do, uh, Richard, uh, is that a lot of these things are fractal patterns and we break them down into much smaller cycles. Mm -hmm. And then the challenge becomes looking for the particular cycle. So it's like the wheel within the wheel, to to quote from biblical uh, sources, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, every other religion relate, you know, mentions this conceptually. Uh, but this whole idea is there's a super cycle, a middle cycle, and a, a small cycle. And the small cycle is the trigger. It's kind of, you know, what, what sets off the big cycle. And, and it hasn't been easy to uh, fine tune this, but we find windows where potential things are going to occur. And February was one of those in this case. Um, so, yeah, it's about uh-huh. fine tuning it. And but I think the more history you can understand, uh, I mean, what all these cycles really are are human behavior cycles. That's what the really fascinating thing is. But also, you know, a human lifespan, what is it, 80 years, 90 years, 70 years? Some of these cycles are beyond that. So there's something bigger out there that's uh, creating these repetitions. Um, But, yeah, it it is all about fine-tuning it using shorter-term cycles. Yeah, and then so today, here we are, right, all these cycles are hitting was there a similar confluence of cycles hitting around 1929, 1930? Well, yeah. Uh, if we look at 1929, of course, it was 72 years on from the 1857 crash. Uh-huh. It was also 90 years on from 1839. Uh-huh. But also, if you look, um, <clears throat> 1929, there was – so the last five years of every century have had huge bull markets followed uh-huh. by big collapses. Now, we only have three samples, you uh-huh. know. Right. what we saw was there's a big 30 year cycle coming in then as well mm-hmm. all right so mm-hmm. you know if, uh, it would have been um 1899 uh, when we look at the stock market data and we've got dow data daily dow data back to um uh, uh, um, uh 1895 and then uh, you know as we've been talking richard we've got long term data within within the foundation that uh, mm-hmm. people like richard Ogie have kindly uh, collated uh, so mm-hmm. Uh, th- this is great. You know, so we, we, when we access this, we, you know, we're just looking for the bigger patterns. But also, you know, if we go back to uh, 1929 and look at um, 1919, there was a big collapse. That was the oil panic. So mm-hmm. we saw that there. 1909 right. had a minor panic after the, uh, the uh, crash of uh, 1907. So you can see that the smaller cycles were coming in as well. So the message is that there is a serious confluence of cycles coming together yeah. right now, um, including a confluence of cycles having to do with China. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a serious time. And and it's probably not over. I don't think it is. Um, I, I, we've talked about this. I've just... Um, published i've been publishing uh, some work on how war cycles are coming together right now and i believe that it and it makes sense if for, for a regular economist you know when things get very bad that you know history shows that economy you know politicians will turn to war to reflate an economy and the mm-hmm. war cycles are coming together mm-hmm. that's a serious topic i hope we'll be able to do a webinar on that uh pretty soon maybe with bill um but that's a really interesting topic of how this all comes together. So I take it, I mean, are you, uh, you know, burying gold in your backyard and, you know, getting out of the markets and running for the hills? I mean, 
How are, no, I have a view what on do people gold do with this that's... information? <laughs> um, well, um, I, I do manage a portfolio, and we did manage to go short from the top. So we've got some good performance figures in, uh, you know, as a portfolio manager. Um, and I do have some strong views on gold based on different cycles. And I'm actually, I actually, this is just a personal opinion. As I said, we put a disclaimer at the beginning. We're here representing the foundation. I do. I am fairly bearish on gold over the next few months. Um, yeah. So. I mean, but, you really know, what I'm asking is, you know, your kind of view, like you, you're presenting some heavy, heavy information here, right? Yeah. And yeah. potentially dire implications. Well, and yeah, you know, it's also about how do we respond to the cycles, right? Right. And, um, and what do we do with this information? Well, um, it's very clear. Protect yourselves as best as you can, wherever you are. I mean, I, I do have followers that, uh, um, you know, that, that did sell out uh, mm -hmm. at the back end of last year and this year. And, mm -hmm. you know, with our, our portfolio positions, we did the same as well. Mm -hmm. um, but where we are now is consider what line of business, because many of you are business people as well. You know, we, consider how you can move on from here. If, 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 you're, if you're already used to, you know, some people have, were forewarned about this and took, took the appropriate measures but just think you know what's the situation if we do go into a war war situation you know how is that going to pan out what places what countries are going to be involved how is that going to affect your business well first of all we want to protect our nearest and dearest our loved ones you know and, and yeah. keep them safe but also uh there are how can you protect your business and then the next question you know further down the chain is is how can you um take advantage of these cycles as well because yeah. Ultimately, wars are very bullish for markets because it steps up industrialization and production in armament. Yeah. So I'm not saying here to take advantage of desperate situations, but this is all part of having the knowledge of cycles. And then again, we will be out of this phase and there will be another boom. Yeah. So no, I appreciated that about kind of your earlier comments at the beginning, you know, like cycles are sort of like seasons. You know, Absolutely. this is a serious time. There is a heavy confluence of uh, long-term cycles all hitting. Um, you know, you, I can personally vouch that you were talking about this over the last couple of years. And, you know, I, I witnessed it myself. And um, in spite of my interest in cycles, my interest has been a little more short-term typically, but you know more history than anybody uh, I've encountered, you know, in, in terms of this cycles world. And I really appreciate you bringing these long-term cycles to our attention. And to me, it really just speaks to the fact that, hey, this is a serious time. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other things we could have talked about, about big changes, you know, that are afoot in our world and in our economy and in our way of life right now. Right. So, um, you know, for me, it's this is something that I kind of keep in mind and, and it gives me kind of a heightened vigilance, I would say, you know, and not really, uh, you know, I, I want the recovery to succeed. I don't want to wish for a collapse, right? But yet it is something that you have to consider as a possibility. So just- Yeah, I, th up I think that's a really good point. Awareness. You know, we, we don't want to see people suffering. We don't, but you know, we, but a, a, a simple way is that after night follows day and after day follows night. So there, the wheel turns and yeah. this is all part of the wheel turning. Yeah. Um, uh, and the key is really to, uh, you know, cycles give us a. if your task is to cross a minefield and uh, cycles provide us with a bit of a map. So if you have a map of the minefield, you, you're likely to be able to get across that minefield without stepping on a mine. But you also do have free will to step on that mine if you did want to. And that's yeah. the advantage. We just get a little bit more information and a little bit more perspective of yeah. where things are heading. And these, you know, I think that's what long term cycles can certainly do. And especially when you see parallels of the same cycles occurring in different phenomena, you know, um, it's really interesting. Well, Andy, thank you so much. There's tons of questions here. Um, a lot of feedback, a lot of positive feedback, a lot of kudos. People really appreciated this. Um, I do want to get to Lars tonight, too. And so I'm going to actually keep us moving forward um, and. Uh, you know, we'll follow up with questions. Um, maybe we'll have a little Q&A afterwards if anybody wants to stick around. And we'll also follow up on blog posts, et cetera. There's a great suggestion that we should have a Slack 
uh, channel for members of the foundation. You know, we have a we set up a members forum on the new website, but hey, why why do a members forum when you can do Slack? So maybe that's a great idea. And let me just use this opportunity to say that you know we we. Uh, we really welcome everybody's input from the cycles community about how you want to see the foundation for the study of cycles move forward and how you want to engage. And, you know, this is about facilitating a knowledge and discovery and a collaboration on cycles to ultimately um, achieve what do we really set out to achieve, which is uh, figure out the mysterious events that cause cycles and, um, you know, have a better understanding understanding ourselves in our world. So thanks for everybody's patience. Uh, and, you know, you're going to be hearing a lot more from us. So um, uh, sorry if I don't get to everybody's questions tonight. We got so many. Um, let's move forward. Uh, Lars, thank you for yeah, being thanks, here Jeff. and for joining us. We're going to kind of move from the very long term, I think, to the shorter term. Um, and this is something that uh, is available to members now uh, at cycles.foundation. It's a uh, uh, cycles analyzer that you built, Lars. Um, I believe it primarily is based on a kind of Fourier, uh, yeah. you know, spectral analysis yeah. of time series data coupled with the Bartels um, test of statistical significance that was really um, very important in the history of the foundation and key to the way that the foundation has analyzed cycles. And I think you learned about from the foundation, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I did. I did. I did. <laughs> so yeah. uh, um, everybody, Lars has been absolutely uh, um, phenomenal in terms of bringing the foundation into the 21st century. Uh, I can truly say we, we would not be uh, in the position we are technologically without you, Lars. So um, you've made a tremendous contribution to the foundation. And um, as our technology evolves and as we are able to communicate with everybody more and have more collaboration and interaction, uh, everybody should give a shout out to Lars because he's been a big part of making this all happen. So Lars, uh, thank you. And let's... Um, go to the website, or maybe you can just introduce the Cycles Analyzer. I think yeah. we should kind of just start. I know you were going to do a weather piece, but I think we should just jump in with, you know, probably the S&P 500. Yeah, we and, can do uh, that. And then maybe we, if we have time, we can demonstrate kind of the custom data feature um, and uh, uh, how to upload your yeah. own data. All right? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Richard, <clears throat> uh, um, for the introduction. And uh, Yes, thank you. Thing everyone so i mean let's directly jump in i think um one area or one important body of knowledge um when, when it comes to cycles is also answering the question how to detect cycles in whatever data series you have and and it's not just stock market data i think it's important that we analyze whatever data series it is and I think most of you know that it's it's a tough job um if you want to pull up these um, um mathematical uh, routines and algorithm and it's not easy for the normal user to to apply cycle analysis to different data sets and this is what the cycle analyzer is about to make it as easy as possible for every one of you uh, to detect cycles in, in data sets so it's about dig digital signal processing and for sure it's using uh, um, um, latest uh, um, state-of-the-art uh, digital signal processing from Fourier to, to special um, routines. So, Lars, your screen is black right now. Are you sharing something or? There we mm -hmm. go. Now, now I got you. Thanks. Yeah, you should, you should see the uh, application. Yep, I see the dashboard. You're right. So this is, this is when you uh, launch the application, which is available, by the way, for every member of the foundation. So, Can so you just go back, Lars, and show, you know, from logging in to the foundation site to how you get to the cycles analyzer. Yeah. And that you can go back to the member area from here. Okay, yeah, yeah just start there. Sure. So cycles.foundation, um, of course, if you wanna make a donation, we welcome your donation. You can click the donate button there and you can join as well, become a member. Um, and uh, let's see, going to the membership and log in right or you're already 
There you go, log in. And this takes you to the foundation member area. And this website, we're also working on an overhaul of the website, so um, should be ready in a, in, a, in a few more weeks. Uh, most of you won't be administrators, so you won't need to worry about seeing the WordPress backend. But once you get in, uh, you can go to the members area. Where is the... Yeah, yeah, uh, you're, just, you're still in as an admin, Lars. Sorry about I'm, that. I'm complicating things. Uh, I need to uh, wait a second. There we go. That's what most people will see. And then the members area. And then the cycles analyzer. Yeah, this is so the starting the, point. And this right. will actually take you to another page, another another uh, sub, sub site, um, app.cycles.foundation. And this is where the application is available to uh, do real-time cycles analyses. So, all right, yeah. I will you get out of your way now. Yeah, you can go forth and back. So um, you can start from the foundation side. We have the cycle analyzer, and then this will bring you directly into the app, and you can then go back to the to the cycles um, uh, foundation side with this click. So once you are in uh, with your foundation account, so directly from the the website, this is this is how the screen will look like. And I mean, you're you all asking for what about the S and P 500? So one thing is about that we already have built in um, major uh, data sets. So on the one hand, you can bring your own data, which I will share in a second. On the other hand, um, if you start with a with a fresh screen, you will see that uh, major um, data sets are there. And if you just click on the, for example, the S and P 500, this will directly bring you to the S and P 500 page. Um, with the cycle scanner interface. So, and this will, on the right-hand side, you will already see um, the active cycles in this market here. So this is what I meant with making it easy. You just open the S&P 500. Wait a minute, Lars, that just was, that, that happened in the blink of an eye. Did that, was that an analysis you just ran? <laughs> on how, yeah, much, it was about how many years of data? <laughs> 70, mill 70 milliseconds, so I mean. <laughs> so it. less than yeah. a second, a yeah, fraction of a second, wow. Yeah, that, that's it, um, and that that's that's the purpose here. I mean, um, if you're interested in the spectrum and the histogram of of the current state of the cycles, this is what the visual uh, state will show you here, um, and the table on the top shows shows you this this list of cycles here from the spectrum just in a table view. So it's the same here. Now the table view and the spectrogram is the current status. So you see, we are here at the um, latest date is here the uh, 1st of May. So I so, think, can we just go to that spectral piece? Because I think that's really valuable. Um, it's easy to overlook because it's below the fold, so to speak. But what it, what Lars is showing here are the different lengths of cycles um, that are you know showing significance. And um, you can see their amplitudes, you can see their Bartels. Uh, basically, the ones with the green arrows above them, and the bigger the, the green arrow, the better, um, are the, the most significant cycles. So this is a good way to kind of at a glance zero in on what are the strongest cycles in whatever data set you're looking at. And Lars has generously uh, provided you know, about 15 or 20 assets that people are mostly interested in that you can yeah. kind of see at a glance. So, all right, so now you can go back up. Yeah, sure. So once you're in, I mean, you can quickly jump between different data sets, not just go back to the dashboard. I mean, if you're more interested in, in Forex data, uh, just pull up another data set and, and here you are uh, just with the cycles in the um, Euro US dollar uh, currency pair um, with the same click. So it's, it's ju just a click browsing different markets um, and you see the current state of the cycles and then you can start your whatever analysis you are interested on. So Go back to the dashboard and even cryptocurrencies are in there um, if you're analyzing crypto cycles forex cycles index cycles or even sentiment data like um, volatility index or the financial stress index from the federal reserve um, which which is there which is weekly data so you can even click there pull up the chart um, and as you see it's 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 all there i mean this is not a static picture here so you can browse the main data um, just within your browser here 
so you can make it larger or smaller, wh whatever you're interested in. So, so this so is let's, not let's look at the VIX. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so this is an, an interesting data set for sure. So it's a kind of sentiment indicator. So just, I know you're, you know, this like the back of your hand, Lars, and you built this. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to ask questions. So you just turned off, you clicked a button over there, the dominant cycle, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so that's yeah. kind of a default cycle that uh, is kind of the strongest cycle according to your algorithms. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I, I so. put this off in this webinar to not go into the details here. So the yeah. dominant cycle is, is, is just the most prominent dominant one from the current market situation. From the here. most recent data, right? Yeah, yeah, from the most so. recent data. It's a little bit op optimizing already, already that's not looking too much into the past, which might be not interesting if you're looking more for the right-hand side of the chart. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, and it's automatically put here uh, below the chart, so you can follow the um, the current dominant cycle here. So you can Good. turn it off. Okay. So then let's look at some uh, strong cycles that are in the VIX right now. Yeah, so. I think what 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 should be interesting. So how how to work with this kind of data? So um, I mean, yeah. what we are interesting is how would this have guided us through the uh, pandemic? And if we go back to the um, for example, before all of this started here, for example, the 14th of February. So the good thing of the analyzer is you can also go back back in time. So uh, with this button here, you can anchor the start point already a little bit into the past. So let's maybe go back to the 14th of February. Um, so we align now the, our analysis date here to the 14th of February and just refresh the current data set. So this is now the in-sample period. So everything past the 14th of February, which I've now put put out of this chart here, is not known to the analysis. I mean, the cycles have already been updated here on the right-hand side. So, and this is before all the mess happened. So, I mean, the stock market was on a very, very high boom phase in, at the beginning of February, and even COVID-19 has not arrived in Europe and the US by this point in time. Right. So I think, it, and, and, now, just using the standard approach, how, how you would use this kind of um, um, tooling here. So you would check what are the most dominant cycles. And I mean here from the spectrogram, this 178 days cycle just stands out. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe the second one is just here, the next quite interesting peak at a length of 104. So we, they both have good battle scores. And are these trading days or calendar days? Um, that's trading days. Trading so it's, days. Okay. Yeah, it's yep. not taking into account the weekend. Good. Yeah. So, and if 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 you think so, these are valid cycles here at this point in time. Yep. So we can put, pull these cycles up here as a composite cycle. So we just click from the top the first two ones, and and this shows you automatically the kind of superposition or composite cycle. Um, which have been detected in this data set here. And if, if we just check in the past how this looks like, so we can make the chart. So just this is this is the point in time at the 14th of February. You can see that just two cycles here, these two cycles um, have been able to explain the volatility index behavior. No? So mm -hmm. be aware that it's more about timing. It's not about the price or, or the raw data. So here mm -hmm. and, and the high in the um, volatility index only re refers to a low in the stock market data here. So we have to to treat this this data here. So a low um, in the uh, fear index then mainly corresponds to a high in the stock market. So it looks like that these two cycles here up to 14 February have been active on the one hand side. This is what mm -hmm. the cycle shows. And what's then more interesting and then moving into the future. So here on the end, let's now go to the the day of the analysis. So, so this just to be clear, the 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 uh, the data, you know, that's sort of in light blue there instead of dark blue. Yeah, that was not available to the forecaster when when the analysis was run. So this is what you would have seen if you had made this chart on February fourteenth, and the future hadn't happened yet. Yes, and right. this is this is so, so that's pretty amazing. Two takeaways. I mean, most people have been bullish by still in the beginning of February. Mm -hmm. So the sentiment cycle here showed it has the larger cycle has been 
turned at the uh, end of last year, beginning of January. Mm -hmm. So the first takeaway was that the sentiment now has turned. And if you see this kind of low here, you would be on, on high alert in regards to, to the stock market that you would expect a kind of high appearing now in the, in the finance index here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just a week after the market turns. And the second takeaway is that the sentiment data already predicted um, by the 14th of February to see here that the sentiment will peak by 27th March. Mm -hmm. It, it not only showed you you should not go long at this point in time, so hopefully you should have closed all, all your long, uh, uh, but it also showed you, okay, we will have now um, at least the sentiment turn until the 27th of February. So the high in the, in the fear index would correlate. So we might see a low in the market by 27th of February. And I mean, this is- Of March. Of March, yeah, what, what, I, what I highlighted here right yeah. now. So and this is just standard procedure. Now I've not tweaked anything or customized anything. Just pick the top two ones which have been there. And I mean, let's, let's now go back to the S&P 500. Um, so, so this is how it runs and we can, uh, sorry, so let's pick the index here, S&P 500. Uh, and I mean- it, So those are cycles right there that, although you're gonna probably stop the uh, input back in February. You wanna do that yeah. again for the S&P? Yeah, just a second, I just wanted to pull up. I mean, you remember okay. on, on the 14th of February, um, the sentiment cycle showed you to expect a market high. Bottom or high or bottom? Uh, uh, sorry, here, we, we bottom here, we have been on the- Around on the, 20, the 27th, right? Of March, of March. March. Right, this yeah. one here. So, so it projected uh, a market bottom, so a, few, um, a sentiment high and a market bottom and the 27th of March, and this is what the market did. So I yep. mean, uh, you, you have been not, so the, just, just by looking at the sentiment and, and we could have done the same on the S&P. So, so let's also go back before the market turned here, for example, so the 14th of February on this point in time, let's click refresh here. So it will pull up. So the, the light blue one is not now now to the mm -hmm. to the analyzer. So this is exactly the same situation we have in the, the boom period. Uh, um, no COVID-19 arrived in Europe and the US. Um, right. So the cycle <clears throat> has been pulled up here now for the S&P. Um, let's go down to the scanner here. So the, you see again, a, a clear peak of a cycle length of 178 uh, days, trading days. Battle score is high, so it's a valid cycle. Uh, and, and the strengths with the with the big arrow here of the green one showing up. So at least this is a, a standing out cycle. And from the amplitude, now you see that there's, if you go down, there's no cycle following with this large amplitude. So this mm -hmm. shows clearly that it's that it's uh, a large Very important cycle. and kind of stands out. Yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of so, distinction. <laughs> Yeah, we can put it on and you see just from the timing, here's the high, market low, high, low, high, sideways, and then a high. So um, by this point in time and not knowing what, what will happen in the future, so even the cycle turned down. So so mm -hmm. in February, from the, from the perspective of cycles or long-term cycles, you also see here that the long-term cycle have passed the peak and are now mm -hmm. turning down from the price mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. So same as a sentiment. So and if yeah. the, you see those two cycles in alignment, so the same cycle on the sentiment data and the same cycle here on the price data, this comes becomes even more interesting because this is not often the case. So if we have this kind of situation where sentiment cycles and price cycle series uh, mm -hmm. are in alignment, it mm -hmm. becomes quite, quite valid that mm -hmm. it's a strong cycle. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah, and this cycle then forecasted um, um, the top here, um, moving down here in, into the beginning of May. Uh, you, you might argue, okay, the market moved down quite quite more, but from this perspective here, it's quite a big downturn here from this perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my statement would be, market has not turned down based on the COVID nineteen. Markets turned down because of the cycle. Mm -hmm. um, COVID-19 just pushed it very, very steep down here, but um, mm -hmm. cycles are the leading force here. Um, yeah, we could, we can go into the future more. So I let's mean, see 56 yeah. day cycle, if you turn that one on, it's got a Which high one? bar tells 56. Do composite 178 and 56, that's pretty nice. No, it makes it now more, 
more clean but let's let's mm -hmm. look to the smaller cycles maybe pick another date so so let's make it more interesting so mm -hmm. if uh once the market turned down um i think for 10 percent or what was this year this low at 20 26 of february somewhere here so let's refresh here mm -hmm. so this was obviously the time when a lot of people asked okay is this now the low should, should is this a good buying opportunity mm -hmm. So now we can look, maybe now let's look on the shorter term cycles, which, which you are so, and let's go back to the histogram. So we still have the longer cycle on here, but this is an, a cluster here. Mm -hmm. So you see the green bars. So these are valid and clear peaks. So you mm -hmm. can even uh, zoom in here. Well, you see this cycle with the lengths of 51 and 55 uh, are mm -hmm. valid besides the longer one here. So we can... We can go up to the um, chart and now put these 51 and I think the, the 55, which have good strength, good mm -hmm. bottles and, and show lower case. And I mean, I think the picture, picture wow. tells you more of the story. So this is when we did this analysis here. So again, mm -hmm. the light blue one was not known. Um, right. So and, right. and this is the interesting point. No, it's not the time to go long here wait until yeah 20th of march this is what the cycle showed us here and, and, mm -hmm. and be aware now the light blue one is not known here yeah. and, and again it's the same picture what the sentiment told you remember the, the longer term sentiment cycles um, um showed you a kind of market low around the 27th of march and this is yeah. the same what the short term price cycles here show you yep fantastic um Bumpers, that was that's fantastic um Again, uh, there are um, some standard data sets that Lars made available on the dashboard. You can also upload your own custom data sets here. I don't really want to go into that tonight. I know we were going to, but we did kind of set people's expectations at about an hour. And really, you know, uh, we've got um, weeks, months, and years of fruitful cycles research ahead of us. and. Um, you know, I, I think we've had a really great response to our presentation today, great interest. And um, if there continues to be interest, you know, maybe we could do this once a week or every other week, um, or certainly at least once a month. So uh, some people are asking how you get access to this tool. You just join the foundation. Um, if you go back to the homepage, you can see a link to join FSC and that's at cycles.foundation. If you're a former member of the foundation in the past, um, you can also, uh, you should have gotten an email from us. We, we contacted as many members as possible from email addresses that we were able to recover from past email lists. Um, and uh, if you were a member in the past, you should have gotten a three month free trial, um, you know, free access to the new site. Um, and if you didn't get that, uh, please email us. You can email me directly, Richard at cycles .foundation. Um, We are an all volunteer uh, organization right now. Nobody's getting paid. <laughs> uh, nobody's taking any money. Um, so your donations are appreciated and your patience is appreciated. Um, we're all really committed to uh, growing and restoring the foundation. Uh, and returning it to its not-for-profit, you know, uh, deep research roots and not just on markets, but on all kinds of cycles. So Lars, your tool uh, really is phenomenal and gives the foundation an incredible resource for people to be able to upload their own data, um, discover cycles, and eventually, I know you're interested in this, kind of creating a, a, a data warehouse of cycles and, and finding, um, you know what do we call synchronicity cycle synchronicities yeah. yeah um and and when you look at you know if we bring andy back on here are you still there andy there you are i am my so, internet went down as predicted halfway through so I'm back. oh good well i'm glad it went through down in the second half not the first half <laughs> so right it's interesting to me to look at you know if we look at your presentation and the long-term cycles right and then we look at Lars's tool and the ability to analyze short-term cycles. That's where you can really see some intriguing opportunities, you know, coming together, right? So 
And, you know, that's kind of what I was probing at with you a little earlier, Andy, because I know you have your own ways, methods for looking at shorter term cycles. But the fact that those longer term cycles were really coming into play, I think, you know, kind of positioned you to be kind of extra vigilant about looking for short term cycle, you know, indicators that could say, hey, this next one might be significant. Right. So. Um, so great to see these both together. I think it really shows you how kind of the long term approach to cycles, um, historical approach to cycles. Uh, hopefully on a new uh, upcoming webinar, we can get into cycles of war. Of course, seasonality. I know Jake Bernstein will be presenting on that again. Uh, um, comes into play. So you can see how all these things start to fit together to really you know, open up some opportunities to hopefully capture some you know, unique market moves. But again, also to um, deepen our understanding of cycles and, and have a greater awareness of cycles in markets, but in our lives as well. So, um, you know, I would just give a personal caution to, you know, anybody who does dive into using these tools, please take your time. Uh, you know, cycles are not magic. Yes, we had some wonderful uh, um, signals and advance notice for some of these recent moves, but the magnitude of these moves are out of the ordinary, you know, um, and, uh, you know, as my, my background is in risk management and really um, uh, take your time, explore the cycles analyzer, um, but please don't, you know, see it as a magic bullet that is going to tell you the exact tops and bottoms and uh, that you can, you know, bet a lot of money on. You have to use it carefully. You have to use it with good risk management. Um, maybe that's a topic we can cover in an upcoming webinar too. Uh, Everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Andy, Lars, Rich, fantastic. Rich, I just, um, yeah, we can have a little Q&A. I just want to kind of indicate that, you know, the, the main part of the presentation is wrapped. This presentation is going to be available. Uh, Lars, I believe we recorded it, right? Sure. And yeah, we'll yeah. make it available to everybody. And anybody that wants to stick around uh, for a little informal chat and Q&A, um, uh, Let's let's talk. <laughs> okay, can I uh, go just, um, add something, Richard? Please. please. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as Richard has said, um, we are a nonprofit. Um, we are looking for uh, there's some. I'm looking at the attendees list. Some real cycle celebrities there. We're really interested in any cycles knowledge papers that come forward. And yes. Thank you for we, mentioning that. Yeah. We we also. Um, um, we have found a lot of unpublished work of uh, Edward Dewey's that we'd like to have cataloged and make available in due course. That's going to cost us money. That's as right. Richard said, we are all doing this uh, uh, as volunteers. And, and uh, Richard wouldn't possibly tell you this, but a, a big, massive thank you to Dr. Richard Smith, who really made this happen. He has put a lot of his own personal money into getting this going uh, as, you know, as a contributor. Uh, most of you are probably not aware of that. So, you know, we're all doing our best. We're, we're back in a new form and uh, we're going to take this to the next level. Uh, and, you know, we really want to touch the hearts of people and help people with this knowledge. Thank you, Andy. Uh, great points. Um, we are, you know, we, we do have the archives, the physical archives. And, you know, a thank you to uh, the previous chair, David Perales, who passed away unexpectedly and um, you know, he really helped bring together uh, with Sherman McClellan um, those physical archives of the foundation. And we um, we have secured them. And uh, Nathaniel Hansen, who's on the call here and the COO of the foundation, has been going through the archives. We'd love to continue to digitize the archives. So great point, Andy. That's a wonderful project. And if anybody wants to talk to me personally about supporting a particular project that you're interested in, um, you know, everybody that's involved in the foundation that's on the board are people who are contributing and making a difference and, you know, growing the foundation in a, um, you know, an open, transparent and nonprofit way. So anybody who wants to get involved in that, please, you know, uh, get in touch with us. Again, you can email me, Richard, at cycles.foundation directly. Um, just ask for everybody's patience because uh, there is a lot going on. And but we're making 
real progress every day. And I hope everybody can see that tonight. So um, getting a lot of appreciation. Thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, Andy, you, you uh, teased your bearish on gold and everybody wants to know why. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, any comments on we that? Maybe we road. should look at gold. Maybe we should pull back up the cycles real quick, Lars, and let's look at okay. uh, what the analyzer says about gold. But do you, you want to do that? So you go ahead first, Andy. Okay. You make your so comments. this is a really interesting thing. We are all individuals in our own right, yep. and we're expressing our own views. And it's going to be very interesting to see what Lars and the cycles analyzer is. And we're show. just three. You know, I mean, there's six on the board, and there's a universe of of phenomenal cycle minds out there who have other opinions too. And the, the, the foundation isn't here to give a single opinion about what we think is happening in cycles. The foundation is here to bring people together who are um, studying cycles and learning about cycles. So, uh, but Andy, you said you're bearish on gold. Why are you bearish on gold? Hey, so um, uh, I talked briefly, uh, probably outside the remit of, well, I'm going to a bit of detail here, but because um, I look at cycles within cycles and fine tune them down, as you know, down to mm -hmm. daily windows, pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have some super monthly cycles coming in for April. I'm starting to see a topping pattern. And, uh, you know, I understand in the geopolitical situation, you know, things could move uh, further north. Uh, but my cycles suggest that we are hitting a um, uh, on, on a monthly, weekly and daily basis that we are close to a high and a bit of a pullback and uh, uh, slightly different technique. Um, we're going to hand over to Lars in a minute, but that's what I'm seeing. And also. Um, so again, just with the uh, disclaimer, this is not trading advice. Um, yes. But um, uh, you know, the commitment of traders' reports are starting to show the commercials are not very bullish. In fact, they're becoming bearish. So um, the key to all this, folks, uh, as Richard said, he is an expert in risk management. He is an expert in risk and anything to do with trading. And we're not just here for trading either. And let's make that very clear. But uh, it's all about risk management, and um, that's what I'm looking at for my portfolio management is that I do cool. think we might head down uh, right. um, and somebody look for a target. I think I've got uh, 1298 or 1300 as a target, but that is just my view. And it's, <laughs> I have yeah, been get too specific, before. man. <laughs> All, All right. right, Lars, let's see what the uh, cycles analyzer says. So this is gold here. This is available to people. Uh, yeah. I, there's been a few questions about how much does a membership cost? It's $99 a year. I think, um, you get access to the cycles analyzer that you're seeing here, also to the cycles library, which is uh, the beginning of a, a very extensive digital archive um, and a members forum, which doesn't have too much activity on it right now. Um, but uh, we will be facilitating collaboration between members, setting up groups. Maybe Slack is a better solution. Large, that's something we should probably look at. Um, OK, let's take a quick look at gold. Yeah, it's uh, just, just confirming. It's just confirming, Andy. I mean, I'm not so an expert in qualities, yeah. but um, your three three cycles, uh, which which might be worth uh, having a look at. One hundred ninety-two day, and uh, what's the other? What's the other big one there? One hundred fifty-three, and then yep. what's that other green one down there? Kind of at the small cycles. Yeah, down this. Uh, yeah, let's have a look. Just. That one, it's 44, one. that's interesting. So it'd be interesting to see those three. Yeah, so I think the first, the first I've just pulled up the first two. Yeah, which I see that, think. add that 44 day cycle on there. There we go. That's that's pretty interesting. All right. But treat it with further care. validation. Pull it up. No? So, but, uh, you know, but this is I the mean, interesting part. Um, I think the if, yeah. if, uh, some of the analysis of longer term cycles, which Andy shared, gets into alignment with these kind of uh, digital signal processing here. So, so right. I think this is this is what's interesting here in, in, the, in the foundation, if we can bring together these knowledge areas. And, and um, so, yeah. All right. Um, fantastic. Well, I think that's a good wrap, guys. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, great presentation. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, let's keep in touch and let's grow the foundation. So thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, all. Bye. Have a nice Bye. evening.